Okay, take it away. Hey, yeah, we really appreciate y'all having us. Um, it's been great um, starting to forge this kind of relationship with kind of our sister chapter up here in Austin. So we're a smaller chapter. We had some members seed to us. Um, we're about a hundred or so. And yeah, we're just gonna tell you a little bit about our campaign. Matt's gonna get into the nitty gritties about the local detail, but we know Austin's kind of dealt with um, a decrim campaign already. So we were like, okay, we don't wanna just tell them how to do something that they've already done. So we were just gonna talk about like the carceral system and how it plays into um, the larger aspects of detention, racism, um, the drug war and stuff like that. And then kind of just whittle it down and localize it to how we approach the strategy um, to combat those elements essentially. And yeah, as a bit of a disclaimer, or I guess not a disclaimer, but just like um, for a shout out, I guess really. So we were um, basically joined a coalition with Mono Amiga and Ground Game. Um, and Mono Amiga and Ground Game kind of laid the groundwork for this uh, campaign. We kind of hopped on afterwards after they had already started collecting signatures. Um, so we're really happy for them to have us. Um, you might have heard of some of Mono Amiga's previous victories, um, one of the first cities in Texas to gain sight and release instead of, um, you know, just straight up arrests. Um, which has had some pretty decent success and had some gains um, for, you know, workers and just people generally in our area. So yeah, big shout out to Mono Amiga, um, big shout out to Ground Game, y'all might be familiar with. I think y'all have done some work together before. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is going to be the history of the prison industrial complex and how racism and drug usage kind of play into that. And then I'm going to hand it over to Matt. Um, and Matt's going to kind of localize it um, to our specific uh, conditions that we're um, organizing with in San Marcos, Texas. So I'll just hit it off. And I'll say that mainly for this, I got a lot of um, my sources and information that I pieced together from uh, Michelle Alexander, some like you could say she literally wrote the book on the prison industrial complex, um, that being the new Jim Crow. She really lays it all out. It's very succinct, it's very digestible, and it's very uh, chronological. And then I kind of just shifted it towards like a drug focused aspect, which she has a few chapters that do focus specifically on the substance abuse aspects. Um, so I'll just dig right into it. Um, so basically a lot of our modern um, prison industrial complex and carceral system got um, started to be formed and developed after the Civil War and the liberation of Black people in the United States. Um, so capitalists in the South and former slave owners, um, who I guess you would now call capitalists, um, were kind of panicked because their whole um, social system of power got ripped away from them and they were looking for different ways to reform to where they could stay a part of that social hierarchy. Um, a lot of so we're taught about radical reconstructionism or radical republicanism as an ideology. That's where the Republican Party, which was Lincoln's party, went in and occupied the South to de-radicalize um, former slave owners and other racist people in that area. Um, so that was an occupation. And when, you know, right-wingers try and claim Lincoln, the party of Lincoln, um, and say that they ended slavery and it's actually Democrats who are racist, you can point out, well, the party back then literally occupied South, didn't allow them to elect their own governments and took all their guns away. So it's a little bit different <laughs> of 
the Republican Party today. Um, so that was radical republicanism. Uh, the next person who was elected was not radical. Uh, they were a Republican in the party sense. Um, so they started to pull out troops and kind of let um, the Southern states have their own self-determination again, um, which basically led to the institution of Jim Crow laws. Um, so a lot of people don't know or don't accredit back then, but many a times when a state says, oh, we, uh, she's the first black uh, congresswoman or senator or congressman or con senator, um, they're not accounting for that radical reconstruction period. So a lot of people had representation in the South and there, there was actual black power getting built up in some infant form back then, um, but Jim Crow laws stripped that away. Um, so essentially what you had with the caveat under the 13th amendment um, that allows for the use of slave labor if you've been accused of a crime. Well, you started having crimes pop up like loitering was developed in this period where it basically gave cops the excuse to arrest people for standing around doing nothing like not having any place to be or what have you. Um, one thing me and my spouse were talking which was mentioned in the book Home, um, Home, I think it's home going, but it might be homecoming. I'm sorry. Um, like one man was arrested for not crossing the street when a white woman was walking his way. But if he were to cross the street, he would have been arrested for jaywalking. So essentially people were just getting arrested left and right. That's a way to kind of reinstitute slavery um, with the carceral system and the state. Because really, um, under capital, especially localized uh, geographically with United States capitalism and capital, um, there's kind of a necessity or a predisposition to need to use free or undervalued labor, um, given our history of taking Black people and immigrants from other countries that have less value of labor than white working class people. So I was kind of interested, uh, well, I found it interesting. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so the, yeah, the 13th Amendment had that caveat, basically allowed slavery. Um, then we, you know, kind of take it forth uh, in the 1960s and 70s with the civil rights movement. They were, so black people and, other people of color and uh, white people who were allies to the movement were trying to undo some of those Jim Crow laws uh, to regain some power for people of color. Um, drug use specifically, because we're here talking about uh, decriminalization of marijuana and how that fits into the socialist movement. Um, things like substance abuse were heavily used against activists during this period. Uh, so much so that many parties, um, namely the one that I'm thinking of off the top of my head, uh, the Black Panther Party, strictly banned drug use or substance abuse of any form, including alcohol, during party or um, organizing activities because it was so heavily weaponized against activists. I kind of wanted to punch some numbers because I think that a lot of things develop this way from my understanding. I'm kind of really heavily into the economy aspect of socialism and capitalism. Um, so I'm kind of always looking at labor power and commodities and trade. I was interested to see the growth of slavery over time in the 1800s until its abolishment to um, the carceral population and at the risk of like sounding too much like Bernie Sanders, um, I was crunching numbers. There was, at the peak of slavery, there was 4 million slaves. That's 4 million people worth of free labor. And then I saw um, our carceral system at the current time is about 1.6 million. So I was like, oh, okay, that doesn't line up. 
um, but taking into account that none of the people getting paid under slavery um, with the racial wage gap of black people and people of color, it actually starts to line up more with the growth. So like 4,000 back in the 1800s, 1860s, late 1800s, and now we're at about um, 7.6 million people of free labor time, if you account for that racial wage gap. Um, and then that's not even taking into account um, the gender wage gap um, because before the 1950s particularly, um, a lot of white women did not work. Uh, so you have that now and you have that wage gap. Um, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. That's no way um, I developed social science. That was me putting stuff in the calculator really quickly, but I found that interesting. And that interesting in the most horrific way, mind you, um, the correlation. So that is all to say like over time, capitalism requires increased and ever expanding cheap labor and free labor to keep up with production. Um, and arguably, so that's kind of uh, under the, one of the few uh, theories, economic theories that economists still kind of give credit to Karl Marx with is the rate, uh, the tendency for the rate of profit to fall. So that kind of increased in free uh, labor is kind of there to make up for that. So now I'm gonna move a little bit forward to our last section and we're gonna talk about the neoliberal uh, element of capitalism. So we're kind of getting into the Reagan era, the eighties to the current modern time. Let's see. So yeah, we're kind of shifting into a new or higher phase of capitalism, depending on your definition. So basically what happened during that period is mass globalization, um, tariffs and taxes started to fall away on uh, international goods. So there was a kind of lack of demand for cheap domestic labor. So what you saw here was huge elements of layoffs and essentially mass unemployment, basically little depressions within urban hubs, such as Chicago is one that people think of, or maybe Detroit, um, maybe not Chicago, but basically within communities of color, it was highly prevalent during this period of neoliberalism that you'd find yourself unemployed. So to make up for this, Capitalism benefits from unemployment if it's small enough. You have something to scare people who are currently working but not getting paid wages, afraid to get laid off of their job or fired straight up. You have basically just a fear tactic. And also when you have a small amount of unemployed people, it kind of deflates the price of labor. But if you have a lot of it, you have basically what's going to be societal unrest and um, yeah, increased in capital, crimes against capital, which is obviously not what capitalists want. So instead of just having people um, unemployed and getting into crimes against capital, they decided to launch what's now known well, I guess it was originally called that when it was proposed, the war on drugs. So that kind of ties all this in to like the decriminalization movement and mass incarceration. So that kind of goes full circle to how we got here. And yeah, so a, a lot of people can't, a lot of, at least in left spaces would agree that um, substance abuse should be uh, a healthcare uh, topic, not a criminal topic. Um, obviously, this is not the case, uh, given the things that I just described. Um, so this kind of replaced, if you think about it, societally, those Jim Crow laws that weaponized just existing as a Black person. Now you're depressed and you're out of work um, and you 
uh, resort to substance abuse to cope. Well, even in cases that maybe you weren't doing substance abuses, mass incarceration for drugs and petty offenses in the United States, 90% um, of them in some areas and sometimes more than that end in a plea deal. So it's not even, a lot of people are pressured into plea deals. So you'll have people that just take the lenient plea deal instead of risking like 20 years in jail, um, things like that. So that's kind of getting us up to the current time period. Um, and this is just a discussion on why decriminalization of marijuana is actually not just um, a talk of prohibition for recreational use. And uh, I just want to smoke weed um, because I'm an abolitionist. I don't, um, yeah, I, I don't really necessarily care so much about the recreational side. While I do think that should be totally fine, my passion lies in it from the abolitionist standpoint. And this is kind of what prison abolition looks like. Um, it was never going to be a case unless there was total societal collapse that prisons were just going to close down and everybody was going to, you know, open the bars up and run out. It's step by step uh, wins, sometimes losses, and forever moving forward. And that's kind of what we see in this local decriminalization effort. Um, I think the fourth most leading cause of uh, people of color getting arrested in San Marcos was because of marijuana offenses specifically. Uh, Mano Amiga uh, launched a campaign um, I, close to around when I moved around the area. And it was monumental because instead of getting immediately arrested and thrown in county or uh, municipal jails, you just get a ticket as if you weren't wearing a seatbelt. And that largely shields a lot of people from the carceral system um, that's hard to get out of once you're sucked into it. So we went over the history and it's kind of, you know, some people are like, why do we have to know all the history about it? Well, you don't like a lot of very successful campaigns throughout uh, the past don't necessarily focus on the historical developments, but if you're really interested in winning and like gripping a campaign by um, like just gripping into it, knowing all elements of it, um, it's good to do a historical investigation. So a lot of socialists, um, not all, will do a material analysis of a problem that they want to solve. And this basically is what's called investigating all aspects of the history and all elements of the current times. Um, so basically what you're looking for is where you're strong with your group of people, your, the people you're fighting, which would be the government in this case, their weaknesses in the element. Um, and basically you take all that and you launch a campaign or an action and if it works, great, yeah, we did it. What's the next step? And then if you have setbacks, you go back to the drawing board and reanalyze it. So that's kind of what doing a material analysis looks like um, with a specific campaign. And in conclusion of my section, basically I'll just say that with racism and the war on drugs and slavery, none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. Everything is interrelated. I used to, th I, I was brought up with the conception that um, capitalism solves, like capitalism solved the civil rights issue. Um, that's not the case. It just became unviable. Um, capitalism benefited off of racial segregation um, from that cheap and free labor. Um, so organizers need to develop intelligent strategies to combat capital. And when you do that and you're successful, that is what effectively building socialism in your community looks like. So that's what we're doing with San Marcos. We have great coalition partners. Um, I wanted to mention again, Mano Amiga and Ground Game because they started this and they've been incredibly accommodating to us. And we recommend um, 
looking out for those organizations and helping out if you have free time, um, I'll drop their websites in the chat. And I think I'm ready to hand it over to Matt to kind of talk about locally and at this current moment what we've been working on. All right, thank you, Roman. So uh, decriminalizing marijuana in San Marcos, it's been uh, decades in the making. And back in 1991, uh, something that we all know about uh, here in uh, our chapter in San Marcos by now is that there are seven marijuana legalization activists. They were known as the San Marcos Seven. And as an act of civil disobedience to draw attention to the demand to decriminalize and legalize marijuana, uh, they decided to light up some joints over at the Harris County Sheriff's Office. Uh, the Harris County Sheriff uh, uh, did not take too kindly to that. And they were arrested and received various sentences as a result of uh, the arrest and criminal charges. Some of them were sentenced either to prison or probation. And in the aftermath of this, one of the guys that was of the San Marcos Seven who was in prison went on a hunger strike. And this resulted in a lot of uh, public outrage over the unfairness of his conviction and, and really just the unfairness of having these types of laws in the first place. Uh, a second member of the Seven named uh, Joe Tack that I've had the pleasure of speaking with uh, he uh, set up tents uh, next to the police station, uh, which would be called uh, Hemp City. Uh, San Marcoans, uh, who are sympathetic to the cause of marijuana decriminalization, they joined in uh, over at that tent city. You had something like a dozen tents next to the police station for, for a while. Um, you know, and eventually, uh, you know, that would get attention from the national media. Uh, and you know, as an early manifestation of a uh, sustained efforts to legalize marijuana. Uh, Joe also would go on to fight a successful legal battle for his personal use of marijuana on the grounds of medical necessity, which was really one of the first uh, cases of its kind. So we do stand on the shoulders of, of giants here in San Marcos. Um, the Ordinance, uh, this ordinance that we're trying to get on the ballot, it would build off of site and release. Uh, Roman mentioned that San Marcos was the first city in Texas back in 2020 to implement site and release. So if you're caught with a small amount of marijuana, uh, the police wouldn't arrest you. Uh, in most instances, they would give you a ticket. Uh, you, you'll then have to deal with the consequences after that. Uh, this would prohibit the San Marcos Police Department from enforcing marijuana possession laws for small amounts of uh, marijuana, which is defined as less than four ounces. It would also prohibit the police from using the smell of marijuana for the sake of probable, probable cause to conduct a search and seizure. Uh, the police would not be able to test THC concentration either. This is very important because with sight and release, best case scenario, you get a ticket, it's a class B misdemeanor, you take a boring four to eight hour class on substance abuse and the prosecution will straight out dismiss the charges. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's off your record. You can still expect to pay uh, an attorney around $1,500 or so to have the charges expunged from your records, which can be searched online and will appear in criminal background checks. There are also massive collateral consequences. I work with one of the major teachers unions and this is the case that comes up uh, for me a lot in the members uh, uh, that I'm dealing with is that, uh, it, you know, they, they're on the way, you know, they, they get caught with marijuana in, in some way or THC uh, concentrates in some way. Uh, this can trigger a TEA investigation to where they could have uh, ne negative consequences for their teaching certificate. And while the maximum penalties for marijuana leaf possession in Texas have largely been reduced to misdemeanors for small amounts, this is not true for THC concentrates. And I've heard horror stories from uh, people coming back from Colorado with edibles or gummies. They don't think that the serious, the consequences could be that bad. Um, you know, police search their car for some reason and they're arrested and they're charged with uh, third or second degree felony offenses. It's treated like heroin. Uh, you could lose your job 
Uh, and of course, many, many people need to keep their jobs and feed themselves and their families. And if you're already impacted by the criminal justice system, it'll make things even worse for you if you are caught in possession of marijuana. You could have your probation revoked, you could find yourself in jail. Um, and of course, the poor, people of color, get the worst deal out of all of this. Uh, and generally, we don't need to allow the police to have yet another reason to oppress us, to oppress our friends, to oppress our families. Uh, Mano Amiga, as, as Roman mentioned, was the community organization in San Marcos that started this campaign. Uh, we, we joined them uh, shortly after they did start it uh, and uh, trying to build off of the earlier success from 2020. Now, San Marcos is a unique place for several reasons. San Marcos has a population of about 65,000 people. It is rapidly growing. Today is one of the fastest growing cities in Texas. It is right in between Austin and San Antonio. For someone like myself, who has only lived in large cities, uh, except for the past, starting the past year in San Marcos, uh, it has something of a small town feel, but it's also a college town. And as people are being priced out of Austin, looking for real estate that they can afford, San Marcos is also increasingly becoming suburban. Uh, we and our coalition partners have encountered obstacles to organizing this campaign in San Marcos. However, they have in no means are they insurmountable. And indeed, we have also noticed some advantages to doing this campaign here uh, and opportunities for a chapter over the course of this campaign and future campaigns. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we have been doing here. So first off, in order to get a proposed ordinance on the balance ballot, we need enough signatures to amount to about 10% of the San Marcos registered voter population. That would be about 4,900 signatures, which doesn't sound like a huge number given what we're trying to accomplish. In fact, it sounds, you know, this is definitely something that can be done. Uh, you don't need to be a big liberal city. Someone has to do it, though. Uh, the difficulty comes in with the word valid. Indiscernible signatures, signatures of people who have not registered to vote, those don't count. Our allies at Mano Amiga, they have been working tirelessly to notarize the signatures as they come in so we can keep and have a running tally of the percentage of all signatures received that are valid signatures. And that's helped us to tweak our approaches in gathering signatures as the campaign has progressed. Uh, San Marcos has a very large college aged population. We're the home of Texas State University, one of the largest uh, universities in Texas. But, a lot, but on, the, on the downside of that is a lot of students are not registered to vote here if they are even registered to vote at all. Uh, initially, we were offering on-the-spot voter registration when tabling and collecting signatures, but uh, you, know, you cannot register to vote and sign the petition on the same day. Now, uh, voter registration of uh, you know, young adults, that's certainly something I think we really, really need to work on here in San Marcos for the sake of future campaigns. But right now, yeah, it's a, it's a problem for us. Um, Many people, however, will want to sign the petition, but they're not registered to vote. And, you know, we've been telling, you know, and we started asking people more, it's like, are you registered to vote before they sign it? So uh, it's important, you know, to leave uh, something with them, like a flyer, something that they can share with others who, who are registered. Because this is something where it's like, okay, well, you can't sign the petition, you're not registered to vote, but you want to help out, right? So do this, give them something that they could, uh, that they can take with them. And I think in a, in a small city like ours, that's really important because every single signature counts a lot here. Uh, San Marcos is divided between Republican and Democrat, uh, but this uh, measure for decriminalization has strong bipartisan support uh, for those who might be interested in similar campaigns uh, in, smaller cities or towns. Uh, 2020, 53% of Hayes County voted for Biden, 44% for Trump, yet 60% of all Texans agree that marijuana should be legalized in small or large amounts for any use, and 28% agree that it should at least be legal for medical use alone. And when you break that down by party affiliation, that's 79% of Texas Democrats 
and 51% of Texas Republicans who agree with the legalization of the sale and possession of marijuana in some form. So, uh, you know, while normally, uh, you know, while, while normally we're enemies, uh, I, I guess political enemies, at least not necessarily personal enemies, but political enemies of, of those on the right, for a campaign like this, there are friends on the right side of the political spectrum. Uh, yesterday, Mano Amiga held a press conference about the initiative side by side with representatives of the San Marcos uh, DSA, our secretary, uh, Chris, uh, he was out there, uh, the Hayes County Democratic Party, but also the Hayes County Libertarian Party. I mean, this is something that the libertarians have been going on and on about. It's like the holy grail to libertarians is to legalize marijuana. You know, and that's good, you know, because we have to make use of personal networks to the greatest extent possible, uh, because there isn't really a big left activist scene in San Marcos. There are some groups, there's us, there's Mano Amiga, there's not much else. So uh, this has been something that we have to, we've had to work around. Uh, we are sending now a petition uh, signatures, letting people know that any individual can collect them, go to your friends and family, turn them in. Uh, reaching out to the Libertarian Party, getting them on board. That's also an example of outsourcing uh, the political networks beyond our own. Uh, because, you know, it, it's like, yeah, I mean, we, we tend to associate with people who agree with us in some way. A lot of our friends are liberals, progressives, socialists. They're not, uh, you know, diehard libertarians or Republicans uh, even. And I would say, you know, reach out. Uh, I, I've tried reaching out to frats even, some uh, student organizations. Uh, I'm going to try giving that another go soon, uh, but haven't gotten any response to from that. But, you know, the, the idea is the same. Uh, try to expand, you know, the kind of uh, networks around this. Uh, we've been reaching out to small businesses, especially small businesses that have a vested interest in the success of the campaign. And, and quite a few small businesses have allowed us to leave petition forms in shops so that their customers can sign them, head shops especially, uh, sometimes enthusiastically, so like Planet K. Uh, small businesses have been very receptive to allowing both the San Marcos DSA and Mono Amiga put up flyers in windows and stores advertising the campaigns. Uh, we have uh, one more thing, a, a social event coming up uh, this Saturday, April 23rd at 6.30 p.m. Put that on your calendars. Uh, San Marcos DSA has agreed to organize a marijuana decriminalization themed social event following the Redbud Social Night. Uh, it's going to be over at a local cafe. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat in a little bit um, with guest speakers. Uh, and live music as well. Claudia Zapata, who's running for Congress, she's gonna be one of our guest speakers. Uh, so has Joe Tack, the guy that I was talking about earlier from the San Marcos 7, uh, uh, will be there too. And we're waiting for confirmation for, uh, for some other speakers. Uh, these kinds of socials, small towns, suburbs, it's a great way for people to sign up, sign the petition, get involved, uh, even if they're not in the orbit of uh, political activism whatsoever. So, uh, so I wanted to, to end this on what you can do to help. Um, and first of all, I would say, this is a really big thing that you could do and it doesn't take a lot of time. Follow us on social media, share our posts related to the campaign, let your friends know about it, share our social media with them, especially if they live in San Marcos. We're gonna have continuing updates about where we are in the campaign and what things are looking out like. You are all influencers, every one of you. Uh, think beyond your friends and think about your friends' friends. Social media offers us enormous potential for connecting with people that we have not met, we have not talked to and bringing them into this movement along with those that they know, that we might not know, you might not know, but they know here in San Marcos, they'll be interested in signing this petition and do, putting in the work. Uh, another thing, uh, as I said earlier, please come to our social this Saturday, 4.23, uh, 6.30 p.m. at Wake the Dead Coffee House. Uh, the more the merrier, and if you know folks in San Marcos, invite them to come with you. Uh, we intend to be doing some canvassing 
in the weeks ahead so we can target registered voters in San Marcos. We certainly need help with this. We simply do not have the numbers. We do not have the capacity to cover large air geographical areas in a short period of time, even when our numbers are combined with our coalition partners. So uh, if we could get a lot of people from Austin uh, and San Antonio to come out for that, it would be great because that's, that's really uh, something that we have yet to have a lot of success with just because we, we don't have a lot of people to go canvassing in all these uh, different uh, neighborhoods and get to all these registered uh, voters. And of course, let your fellow, let your comrades in the Austin DSA know about us and know what's going on. Our big issue, unlike yours, is that we need to, we need to make people know that we exist. Not only that we exist, but that we have this going on and that we can win. So uh, yeah, um, thank you for, uh, for uh, sitting through my shtick here. And uh, I guess that, that'll wrap it up for me. <laughs>